Hello, everyone, and uh, uh, welcome to this session. And uh, it's really nice that we're going to discuss on uh, remote sensing. Uh, so basically, as we have already discussed, and we have discussed a lot of actual on remote, uh, not remote sensing, actually, it was yield uh, mapping. And it was a really good class that uh, we had to make a follow-up and see like how it was performing. And now we uh, we have to focus in a new thing, which is quite common nowadays, but remote sensing. And this is a quite good technology that is used now. Um, remote sensing uh, is a group of techniques for collecting information about an object of an area without being in physical contact with that object or area. So. <clears throat> Uh, basically, what you do is uh, you might uh, need to do something that is quite uh, close to what you want to achieve. And uh, this can be uh, uh, something like uh, you see it and you want to collect. Sometimes there are some stuff you cannot see. So you need to use specific senses to do that. And you don't, want, uh, you don't uh, need physical contact. And this is very common. For example, you want to sense something from your farm and uh, you are away by using maybe a drone, for example, or you're using an open. you can collect by using a normal, uh, normal camera. But sometimes there are some features of the plants that you would like to see or to discuss, but uh, all these features, you cannot see them. And uh, so you need a specific uh, a spectral image. So you need to sense some of the waves that are emitting from them or anything that is related to nature of how the plants are appearing. So different senses actually can be incorporated in the aerial and satellite imaging. And uh, we talk about proximal, it means the sensor is very close to the, to the target, for example, to the plant, maybe a person is holding a camera, or it can be a drone that is flying over a farm and the drone can just fly for a few minutes to collect the images. And then you do some calculation and then you uh, you come up with a, a very uh, a very sensitive, uh, a very comprehensive information that can be used actually to improve uh, farming conditions. And sometimes you might need a satellite and this is due to scale. Like you need, you really need to calculate, for example, uh, how plants are performing for the whole of Tanzania. So you cannot fly uh, a drone over Tanzania. So you need satellite and this satellite, this will give you information that is quite useful. But thankful that uh, there are a lot of images that are available and you're going to talk about few satellites that are very common that uh, provide all these services that we can use actually to improve agriculture. Now, <clears throat> so uh, basics of remote sensing, actually we talk about the measurement of energy that are reflected or emitted from objects without coming into contact with the object. So every object has some energy that there it can be heat energy, can be, uh, can be waves, any kind of waves, and these, uh, uh, and this energy actually can be measured because they have what you call it magnetic energy. So for example, for visible, visible light, because we see all the plants during night, for example, during night, we cannot see, maybe we need light because we need light so that we can improve our visible spectrum. But there are some waves that we don't see. For example, there are waves that you need a radio, for example, to sense, for example, you're transmitting electromagnetic spectrum uh, like FM, eh? frequency, um, modulation or uh, amplitude uh, modulation like AM, or you are transmitting uh, digital uh, information by using a uh, microwave, like uh, for example, Azam TV, they're using a dish to get all those information. So you can, you might need a certain device in order to detect certain kind of, of wave. You remember the case that happened uh, uh, in Asia, like uh, they had uh, they had certain waves that were coming and uh, human beings were not able to sense but most of the animals actually they were able to sense and they knew that actually tsunami is coming. So every, uh, every animal was trying to move and move uh, away from that. So uh, it was, uh, it was uh, a tragic because uh, people, human beings were not able to sense. So you might need a sensor to sense all those kind of wavelengths or energy that is traveling. Um, so, uh, how objects interact with the electromagnetic magnet. When electromagnetic radiation strikes, an object um, uh, will have three things will happen when, uh, when there's an electromagnetic strikes. First, reflected by the object, 
probably the object itself is reflecting or transmitted through the object like sunlight through a glass window or probably absorbed by an object like sun, uh, like sun brother soaking up the rays. Most objects do more than one of these things when light hits it. So all this information you can use then to collect and then sense. So an object affects each wavelength of a light hitting, hitting it. And it depends on the characteristics of an object, actually the angles at which the light strikes. So all this kind of information is, uh, is, 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 way, is quite important. So every object to a group of objects examined by remote sensing reflects a unique spectrum of wavelength. So this is, this is kind of information that you might, uh, uh, you might be interested to explore. Like unhealthy plants, for example, produce different spectral responses or characteristic patterns. So you can actually detect, for example, chlorophyll is, not, is underperforming or crop is under certain stress. And this information actually can give you insights if, if it's, it's nitrogen stress or probably it's phosphorus stress or probably it could be uh, water stress, like there is no soil moisture, enough soil moisture. So all these kind of information you can incorporate and then do uh, a very uh, a positive decision. Now, for example, we know ozone layer and we know water and carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. All these actually, they absorb certain wavelength of energy from the sun. Shadowing, color, uh, cloud covering can reduce the amount of light hitting an object. So actually, because uh, we are talking about sunlight here. And temperature also is also, uh, uh, temperature also affects the spectrum of energy, uh, of energy reflected and emitted from objects. So energy emitted from objects due to heat is in infrared wavelength refers to as a thermal band. So we can determine and we can actually uh, see thermal band. So uh, actually we can determine the temperature of a plant by using remote sensing because you can sense all these kind of, of things. Yeah, you remember there is um, a very famous movie we used to watch when we were kids, it's called Predator. It was acted by uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger. And uh, this guy actually, uh, they had a, uh, uh, they had this uh, predator and the predator actually was seeing uh, every human being as red compared to red or something. And then, so even if you are hiding, this predator is, is going to see you. And there is one other um, very interesting uh, stuff that happened in Gulf War actually, the United States were fighting against uh, these people and uh, they were seeing, the, so they wanted to do war, but they were doing it during night. So all these people were like, how do they see us? And it was through thermal band because they are detecting the thermal band and actually they can see if a human being is in, inside the building. And they were like wondering how could this be possible? But after a few, uh, after this knowledge uh, spread around the world, so everybody knew like, okay, it was thermal imaging. And uh, these are kind of concepts that are quite important to understand. Now, um, so there are different remote sensing. So we can have passive or active sensing systems. So with uh, active sensing system, we are talking about the system that generates a signal of uh, bounce it off of an object and measure the characteristics of a reflected signal. So, uh, so uh, all these kind actually, for example, very good example is uh, radar. You know radar? Uh, Tanzania, we, we had to buy radar, for example, to detect airplanes that were moving uh, on open air. So because radar can send signal and then when the signal comes back, it can determine where the object is and how far it is. So it's, it's, it's quite useful technology and it's used actually to monitor crop moisture status and it works very good in cloud conditions compared to um, uh, normal uh, imaging systems. Passive sensing systems receive naturally emitted and reflected signal from the sense objects. So great value in a cultural production um, because you can sense, for example, you can sense plants uh, because they emit and can provide a wealth of information that we can use actually uh, to determine the health of a, uh, of a plant. And this is quite important information. And you can use this in other sectors, in the energy sector, uh, we can use all these kind of information in uh, social uh, social issues or social study. So passive sensing system, they're quite important. Now, uh, because they need to measure this, they have certain resolution. For example, one of the very important is spatial resolution. So with spatial resolution, uh, you can measure performance by looking at the size of the 
smallest object distinguished in an image produced by remote sensing. And we can know actually more sensitive system. For example, when you have a, a for normal, uh, for normal uh, cameras, like when you have 1K camera, for example, compared to 720, 1K has a very good picture. 4K images, actually they're quite uh, detailed and you can see a lot of information, uh, but uh, they take a lot of memory. So that's, that's a disadvantage. And also spectral response, ability of a sensitive system actually to respond to and collect radiation measurement within a particular uh, spectral band. And this is quite important because here we're focusing on detection of these signals. And then we have this, uh, the, the, the third one actually is a spectral resolution and ability of a sensing uh, system to distinguish or differentiate between electromagnetic radiation of different uh, wavelengths. So, um, here we are focusing actually on uh, 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 on how the system actually uh, can tell us and distinguish, and this is quite important because we need this actually to differentiate the signature. And we know this is a signature of a red band, this is a signature of a uh, blue band or green band or near infrared, and this is quite important. Temporal resolution is a measure of how often a sensing system can be available to collect data from a particular site on the ground. For example, we have satellites. Maybe when you have stationary satellite, probably to provide data over the same place every day. But sometimes you might have um, a, a synchronized satellites that are moving around. So maybe they, it will be passing at least maybe one day or every six days or every every week or it depends or maybe every month it depends on how it is collecting and also even if you are using drone you might decide which day is actually going to collect images you cannot do it every day because it can be expensive so you need to measure uh you can take uh, uh you can you can decide in which uh uh actually you can decide which satellite is good for you to use and depending on the temporal resolution and what you want to need, for example, if you want to uh, to do irrigation uh, scheduling, this could be very important to know. Now, let us uh, discuss on uh, characteristics. So, characteristics we need uh, of sensing systems. So, sensing systems they have what we call platforms, and platforms are used to hold sensing devices. Uh, these vary in altitude above the target, and two main platforms, uh, maybe air, uh, aircraft based and satellite based but also we have what we call proximal. Proximal can be a human being, can be anybody that is very close or a robotic system that is close. And also we have aircraft based, for example, drone in this kind of uh, sensors and sensor base which use electro optical sensors. Uh, how do we use this data? No, true value of remote sensing actually is ability to acquire a vast amount of information in a very short time with a minimal over input, for example, uh, if we want to do soil fertility uh, determination, or we want to detect weeds, or we want to actually to measure uh, insect infestation or disease infestation, this is quite sensitive because uh, uh, remote sensing, uh, remote sensing, we expect it to give us value in the quickest time possible. Now look at this: um, the process of applying remote sensing. Uh, to site-specific crop management can be on collection, for example, acquiring remote sense data can be uh, after, after collecting image, then you do some pre-processing, for example, calibration, maybe subsetting to the area of interest, registration of images, and then you'll be, uh, the next will be image analysis, for example, enhancement, interpretation and classification. And fourth will be ground validation and verification, referring actually of remote sense data to a situation observed on the ground. And this is quite important because we need to measure and trust the images because actually we trust our manual systems like measuring, but uh, for these uh, remote sensing uh, technologies, actually you need to, to validate. Uh, and then incorporation uh, like in, uh, remote sensing ground reference data to create a continuous attribute specific uh, map of field condition typical through use of GIS. And uh, at the end of this class, you get, uh, because uh, now with the UQF system, actually it is encouraged for us to, uh, to do uh, to student-centered. So, uh, you, so for this, for GIS, you will learn by doing exercises. And uh, so I'll, 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 I'll give this uh, as an assignment for all of you. And uh, I, don't, 
I think that will be that will be quite useful. So identification of uh, of course the effect relationship between patient variables and uh, crop or soil conditions, and then treatment or action using site specific techniques. So all this kind of information it needs to give you a uh, quite good information and uh, uh, insightful uh, decision that can uh, can improve uh, crop management. Now. There are two categories of image correction techniques. So you can do what you call radiometric correction, which is data calibration curves can be used for correctness or geometric cor uh, correction. You identify and use ground control points that can be used for correctness. And necessary to, uh, it's quite necessary because you need to reduce image distorting effects. Uh, there are a lot of stuff when you're taking image, for, for example, from the, from the sky, use uh, satellite images. There are a lot of uh, layers. There is troposphere, uh, there is uh, vapor, which is water droplets, and we have cloud, all these kind of stuff, actually, they're going to, to reduce the quality of your image. So you need to do image corrections and make sure like you, uh, the images that you get is what the information is quite correct. So uh, remote sensing images are accompanied by graphical outputs and descriptive statistics. So you can uh, produce histogram, uh, for instance, uh, to graph the frequency of distribution of pixels within different color and uh, spectral bands. Now, uh, that analysis must have uh, that interpretation because uh, before, you, uh, before you get a useful uh, management information, this is quite important. You need to do a very good data analysis. And, uh, we have different techniques you can do this and uh, using actual geographic information systems. We, uh, we, are can do, we can do a very good job on this. Uh, uh, also, uh, we might need ground reference like what I've said for verification of uh, remote sensing data, especially on types, uh, on making sure like the images are lying the way they should be uh, being laid because, uh, because of uh, changes, maybe they can have been distortion or something that happened. So you need to do this carefully. There's also base map contains at least field boundaries, for example, and that on civilian visible surface features and boundaries. So you might need the base map actually to use this to, to make sure like you extract your field exactly from the, from the images that you obtain from a satellite can be from drone. And this is quite useful so that you can, uh, you can work on the field of interest. Uh, there are a lot of sources of uh, satellite data. And one of the famous one is Landsat satellite. Uh, we are first launched by the US for Earth Resource Monitoring. The most recent one where sun synchronized orbits, each pass of a given point on Earth occurred at the same local time once per repeat cycle. And uh, data from Landsat is produced by two types of sensors. So it has a very good map spectral scanner, which collects data in several wavelength bands, and this is, uh, we are going to use this actually to explore um, Tanzania and DVI later on. Uh, and then it has what we call semantic mapper, which creates map of different surface features, categories, or themes. And uh, then such uh, imagery is ideal for gauging veget vegetation cover shifts because it supplies spectral data for surface areas of about 90 square meters. This is a very fine resolution. Uh, and these are kind of data that are, that are provided. You can see like lens, one, uh, lens at one to three, it had very few band, uh, no band were sharing and uh, lens, uh, lens at four and five, they increased. And now we have up to band 11. So, and this, uh, you can see also the, free, uh, the wavelength. And uh, we use this wavelength to differentiate which one is red, which one is green, it depends on the, car, on the, on, on the wavelength. Uh, another which is quite famous is the spot, which is the satellite from the French guy. From the French guy is actually, uh, it's a second major remote sensing source operated by the French government. SPOT is a commercial high resolution optic or image uh, satellite system operating from the space. It is run by SPOT image based in Toulouse, France. It was initiated by CINES in 1970s and uh, was developed uh, in association with SSFTC. And this, uh, uh, they work together actually with the Swedish uh, National Space Board. So um, 
there are others which were, uh, were launched later. So it is quite advanced. Uh, so for example, we can have uh, different sources of aircraft-based remote sensing compared, compared to actual to satellite-based sources. They have fast turnaround, for example, because this aircraft, you can, you can fly it anytime you want, increase accessibility because they are very close to the ground, greater flexibility with respect to image area and location orders. You can decide which area is your focus area. And uh, the last one, which is quite important, is increased priority with the sense dedicated to agriculture application, which is our focus here. <clears throat> so satellite and aerial vendors, uh, minimum orders are required to pay for sensor upkeep, pilot flight time, and fuel cost. This is this is um, this is the expenses they use actually to keep up with all these systems. So, for example, satellites. Some of the satellites are maintained by the government, like we, what we said, like uh, French, uh, French government, maybe uh, maybe the American government. They maintain some Chinese also, Japanese, and we have also European satellites. So, it needs somebody who will be uh, who will be paying for them. And also we have commercial ones, which the vendors, uh, like you have clients will be paying for services. Uh, and uh, all these satellites, they produce different products. And one of the products include bare soil image data, original reference image send, normalized vegetation index map, assorted vegetation index map from other indices, and a vegetation change detection map. And um, all these are quite useful. Uh, we're going to discuss a little bit on vegetation index because it's one of the quite important stuff that we're going to do. And uh, as we uh, as explained uh, later on, actually, we are going to explore artificial intelligence, which is the main task that uh, uh, is the main focus area now, like to determine and improve how vegetation index actually produces all these kind of uh, maps, but to improve that information by using uh, machine learning. Uh, but we do all this stuff because first, first, for for this kind of data to be useful, first they need to be correct, and uh, being correct is is not is not negotiable. We really need it to be correct, and data must be in correct form and in high resolution because we want to get all this kind of information that will be useful. Because when we talk site specific. We are not looking on uh, measuring large fields. We are looking on measuring very small fields. And high resolution will give us a chance actually to explore two acres, three acres farms, which is common for, uh, for, for smaller order farmers, uh, which are common in Tanzania. And another thing is turnaround time. If we are using a satellite actually to, uh, to predict irrigation, we really need to do this. Another thing uh, which is quite important here, and I want to discuss with you guys actually is vegetation index, as I said. So vegetation index, uh, index is a spectral transformation of two or more bands. So we have bands, but these bands, they can give information, but sometimes you cannot get correct, uh, 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 or you cannot expect to get uh, information that can be useful. So we need to combine these two or more bands designed to enhance the contribution of vegetation uh, properties and allow reliable spatial and temporal intercomparison of terrestrial uh, photosynthetic activity and canopy uh, uh, structural variations. This is, is, this is quite important because here we are talking about vegetation and when you want to vegetation, we want to see the vegetation properties. So we really need to see uh, how the vegetation, uh, uh, how its vegetation is, is changing. For example, from the time of planting until at uh, the time of harvesting, how spatial is changing and how temporal uh, is changing. All this kind of information will lead us to have a very good uh, uh, understanding of uh, photosynthetic activity of a plant and uh, determine kind of structural variation and know exactly how the plant is performing. So uh, vegetation is have been historically classified based on range of attributes, including the number of spectral bands, how many, are they two or greater than two? Second, the method of calculation. Is it ratio or orthogonal, depending on the required objective, or by the historical development, classified as first generation VI 
or second generation VIs. Uh, some of the very common, very common uh, attributes that we use actually is leaf area index, percent green cover, we might need this. We might need also to determine chlorophyll contact. We might want to do green biomass, which is quite important. Or measure absorbed photosynthesically active radiation, APAR. And another thing that is quite important and I want to discuss is few of these uh, vegetation index. So we discuss few because there are a lot of them. And uh, maybe I would like just to mention and chip in and uh, give you a chance actually to go and explore more. One of the very, uh, very important stuff that I want you to, to understand is the ratio vegetation index. Ratio is a ratio between red and near infrared lights of multispectral images. Another one is normalized different vegetation index. And normalized uh, different vegetation index, NDVI, is the most commonly and famous one used to, for remote sensing index that calculates the ratio of difference and sum between near infrared and red bands of multispectral images. And uh, normally it ranges from negative one to positive one. And this is quite useful. This is quite useful, especially when we want to do vegetation dynamics monitoring, including biomass quantification. And there is uh, this kind of uh, another, uh, which is uh, soil adjusted vegetation index. Uh, so this is an adjusted form of NDVI developed by, uh, to minimize the effects of uh, soil brightness on spectral vegetation index, particularly in areas of very high uh, soil composition. Uh, we have others actually, which is commonly used, uh, enhanced vegetation index, very similar to NDVI. The only difference is that it corrects atmospheric and cannot background noise, particularly in region with high, very high uh, biomass. Moisture stress index, a spectral index that measures the level of moisture stress in leaves and uh, gives you like a chance to decide, for example, maybe you need to regate quickly or leave it. And another one is modified SAVI, mostly applied in, uh, into areas with raw NDVI measures. Um, so you improve your, you, you do NDVI, and there are some pieces may have very low, it can have very low NDVI. So you might use modified SAVI actually to improve uh, the condition. And you have a lot NDVI, we have a lot of these uh, uh, vegetation index. You can explore online if you want to to do it. Another thing which is quite important, uh, most of the sensors, now they incorporate hyperspectral vegetation, uh, hyperspectral bands. And hyperspectral bands actually, they give us a chance to explore more into detail uh, of, uh, of, one to, of what we want to achieve. And this can be, uh, uh, and uh, this is quite important. Uh, with the advent of hyperspectral data, vegetation indices have been developed specifically for hyperspectral data. So this band normalize this uh, difference vegetation index. You can use this by using spectral data that you obtain online. You can use, uh, uh, you can obtain yellowness index, or you can do photochemical reflectance index, or you can do disk band normalized difference, uh, difference water index. You can do red edge position determination. This is quite important. You can do crop crawl of contact prediction, and also you can do uh, what we call moment distance, distance index. So all these kind of indices, they're quite important they are, and very useful. But um, because of its importance and uh, how famous it is, I really want to uh, share with you uh, some details and uh, some quite important information on how NDVI is done. I'm doing this, this because uh, NDVI is quite famous and uh, uh, we are going actually to practice of on how we can do NDVI, specifically for Tanzania, because uh, for example, now we have one problem like rainfall. We didn't get uh, we didn't get rainfall, especially for this uh, for first by model. So uh, for this period from uh, October until December, until January, so we didn't get enough rain, and most farmers they didn't plan, they didn't plan. Uh, and if there are some who planted, actually we can take satellite images and measure how the crop was performing because most likely they were irrigating. And if they were irrigating, where do you get that water? 
if the if the rivers are dry or you don't have enough water. So we got a, we, we got all these problems because uh, uh, we don't get uh, we don't get enough water. So you can determine actually in places where they have planted, you can determine how the crop how the crop was performing. And uh, we all know, like, if you are doing irrigation, most likely the crop will perform very good. So NDVI actually is calculated by taking near infrared minus red, uh, red band, and then you you divide, uh, you divide by the uh, sum of near infrared plus red. That's how simply NDVI is done. And uh, for example, this is the output, and uh, this is the output of of NDVI. So NDVI actually, uh, you can see there are some places where it is quite red. This area, there's no plants at all. It's a drawn out spot. Like you can see these red places. And when you see quite green one, it means the area with highest index value. It means crop is well performing. And uh, there are some places like here, uh, it looks like the plants were water stressed where water stress. But also you can see these tracks here. This kind of tracks actually they, they show that how the tractors were moving over the, over the field. And uh, these machine tracks actually uh, maybe can be, uh, can be tractor or can be uh, machine tracks, irrigation machine tracks that are moving over. And uh, when they pass, they give those all kind of tracks. And these are the, some of the tracks you can see straight one. So uh, areas of a planter skips and headlight, headland tracks. So all these kind of information will tell you how, they, how your farm is performing. And you can determine in which area you're going to get a lot of yield. For example, here, this green place and this green place, a farmer should expect a lot of, uh, 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 a lot of yield from those, kind, uh, from those places. So vegetation interests have been used to examine climate trends for a climate uh, modeling and climate studies. And also they've been using the culture to estimate water content of soils uh, remotely and decide if you want to irrigate and also to monitor drought. Like we, we experience, we're experiencing drought in Tanzania, especially from uh, late September up to, uh, to December. So we can determine quantitatively how much, uh, how, how the drought is in Tanzania. And then we can schedule a crop irrigation. If you get any information that is quite important, for example, water content, then we can do uh, uh, crop irrigation scheduling. And also we can improve our crop mon uh, management. We can monitor evaporation and uh, uh, plant transpiration, which uh, we use all this uh, kind of information actually to do scheduling, uh, crop uh, irrigation scheduling. And then we can assess changes in biodiversity. By using, uh, by looking at temporal changes, actually we can determine how big the cities become. Because when you have plants and some, when time goes, most people tends to, uh, most of the cities tends to grow. And so the plants will be, uh, will be cut down. So when you look at the land cover by using NDV, actually you can sense, or by using any kind of vegetation index, you can sense biodiversity, you can sense, uh, you can sense land cover, and also you can classify vegetation. Uh, unless uh, for economically, how is, is this what sensing economically viable uh, technology? Unless it will turn a profit, widespread adoption is highly unlikely for now. Why? Because of the cost. First, image type, panoramic versus multispectral. Image size, ground coverage, the level of processing required, timeliness of data, spatial resolution desired. For example, we were interested to do th this kind of research, but we were hindered on the server that we can use to process the data. Uh, very glad that we, we, we have purchased, and I think some of you have already joined Yes Lab, which is uh, in yes.org. You can go to my website, you can see the website also. So we plan also to use that uh, server actually to explore uh, this kind, uh, this advanced technology because adoption, adoption is unlikely for now, but most likely it will happen in near future. But to reach that, 
we really need to do research and make sure like we, we quantify how profitable is this technology for Tanzania. Um, we are going to the end. Uh, you remember we had, a, we had a, an assignment that I wrote in class last time. Please turn in by Friday. Uh, you can do that by giving a class rep. And then uh, I would like to give you another work that uh, can give you a very good insight actually, and uh, can give you a very good addition in your knowledge. For example, I want you to calculate NDVI over a crop museum at the crop museum. So what I want you to do uh, is uh, get the images, uh, get the images from, uh, uh, get the images from Earth Explorer portal. And then after getting all those images, you just need a red and near infrared bands. And then you can use those one to calculate NDVI by using QGIS. Uh, you can do that over the crop museum and you can use Landsat, uh, Lens, Lens, Lensat collection data for January, 2015. Probably you might get very few, maybe for, maybe for only four days or something. Yeah? And then you can use that to, uh, to calculate NDVI and then get a, what we call precision map of NDVI showing where it is performing and explaining. And also you need to write a report on how you have done that. And then you can send that to my email. So the easiest way you can do is you collect all the work to your class lab and then the class lab will forward the final one because I really want to see the images. You don't want, you, I don't want you to print this week. So you don't want to print. You, you just submit a soft copy and this will be done by next week. Thank you very much.